Okay, so the topic of the day, solving polynomial equations. So get everybody all pulling away and everything, everybody's attention right up here. Okay, so this is, we're not going to get through the everything. We're going to have a short day today, but I just want to get you thinking about the main topic. This is the main topic of, of chapter six. Uh, and it's, it's a lot easier to appreciate and understand if you think about what you already know, because you already know a lot. We've already done this for specific types of polynomials. Think what we've done this year. If we go back and, if, you know, we're going to continue, we're going to kind of extend what we already know. But you tell me, what kinds of polynomial equations are you capable of solving right now? What can you do? Give me an example of one that you can solve. Go ahead. Haley? Okay, we know how to do arithmetic, but I'm saying what kind of polynomial equa equations do you know how to solve? Like solve for x, for example. Quadratic. Sure. So we know how to do something. And, and what other ones? We can start easier. What other ones do you know how to do? Linear. Sure. You guys know how to solve something like 3x plus 4 equals 9, right? How do you solve that? And, and your strategy is what? Isolating x, sure, right? Isolating x. So that, those are that falls. Those are easy, right? Those we can take care of with stuff we already know. That falls under the umbrella of when there's a single x, you can isolate it. You don't even have to know it's a polynomial. That strategy is going to work widely for other kinds of functions also. It works for some polynomials though. It works for that one. It works for this one, doesn't it? That's quadratic, but it's still one where we can isolate x, right? Okay. Uh, what about something like this? Yeah. Yeah. So what would I do with that? I've been just recently done this. Quadratic. Okay, we, we could use quadratic formulas, sure, right? With, with, for quadratic polynomials, we always have a go-to easy way to do it. If we just put the quadratic equation in standard form, there is this nice, convenient quadratic formula that always gives us the solutions to the quadratic equation, real or non-real, right? That's really nice. Uh, unfortunately, there's always an unfortunately, right? Moving on to, to higher level polynomials, that's not always the case. For example, if we want to solve something like, let's say, this. If we want to solve something like There is no such convenient cubic formula available. There actually is a cubic formula, but it's really hard to use. It's not something that's really practically used. Uh, but we have to do something different. We have to find a different strategy. So, you know, a good logical approach to take something like that might be to say, well, let's go back to an easier branch of polynomials, like quadratic polynomials. <clears throat> and see if there is a strategy, a different strategy. You know, we have the quadratic formula, but is there a different strategy we have for solving this equation that might apply for polynomials of larger degree? So let's go back to this guy for a second. Is there another strategy for solving that? We could complete the square. Uh, completing the square, unfortunately, that's not one that's a real practical strategy. Completing the cube would be a, doesn't really work for us, but it's a good idea. What's another one? Factoring. Factoring, yeah. This is a polynomial that factors, and it factors pretty easily, doesn't it? This is one of those quadratic expressions where A equals 1, and those, in fact, honestly, the best way to solve this equation really is to factor. You can use the quadratic formula, and you're pretty used to that and accustomed to it. And that, a lot of times, that just becomes the first strategy of, that, that you choose. <clears throat> but really, it's not the best this time, especially when a equals 1. We always want to ask ourselves, are there magic numbers that work? And if they are, factoring is a really quick and easy way of, of getting 
solutions. So are there magic numbers here? Negative seven, positive four, right? That works, doesn't it? Those are two numbers that multiply to negative 28 and add to negative three. So we could just factor this into x, the product of x minus seven times x plus four, then what? Solve. Solve how? You're right, solve how? What, what, what property are we gonna use to solve this? Oh, what are the end? First of all, what are the solutions? X equals seven, seven or negative. negative four. Okay, what's what's the property you just used? You did the right thing. You found the zero of this factor, right? And the zero of that factor. What's that called? The zero product, the zero product property. Good, so we used the zero product property and we found the zeros of both factors, and just think back to why that is. I don't want you to lose sight of why that works. It's, it's real simple in algebra sometimes to fall into the, the pattern of just doing the algebra without kind of losing sight of why you're doing it. And I'd urge you not to do that. You know, think about this as you go through this. There's another opportunity. Because the zero product property says that the product of factors can only equal zero when you're multiplying by zero, right? That's the only way to get a product equal to zero. And so the only way this could work would be, the only way would be the values of x that would make the first factor zero or the values of x that would make the second factor zero. Is there any reason that that would have to be limited to just two factors? No, no, we could have a product of more than two factors and the zero product property would apply just as well, wouldn't it, right? Okay, so that is a reasonable strategy for us to pursue then, isn't it? Right, for bigger for bigger polynomials. And so that's really what we're gonna do. Now, this, take this, I mean, you have, you have to kind of think of this, understand the limitations of this strategy also, don't you? Because there weren't really very many times that factoring worked for us with quadratics. And in the same way, oftentimes, larger degree polynomials are not going to be factorable. Now, we are going to just look at that little subcategory of polynomials here that are factorable. And then later on, we'll talk about maybe some other ways we could find those other zeros, okay? Uh, let's just get a little more practice with this. I want you just to, and it's, the good news is, probably the factoring that you did in chapter five was every bit as hard, if not harder than most of the factoring you'll do in chapter six because you factored some pretty hard problems, right? You factored the ones with A not equal to one, and those were sort of a pain to do, right? Let's look at one of those, just, just to kind of review a little bit, kind of get thinking along the lines of factoring. How about something like this one? Let's talk about our strategies, quick review. Okay, so what about how am I going to solve that one without the quadratic formula? Let's say. Say it again. Move it all to one side, get it in standard form, good. So that's gonna give us three x squared, right? Uh, what, minus five x minus eight equals zero. Okay, how can we factor that? A times C then split B, right? That's, that's certainly one way we could do it. So what is AC? Negative 24. Good. Are there factors of negative 24 that add to negative 5? Oh, okay, 6 and 4 are factors, but they don't add right. Do they? 8 and 3 would work, though, wouldn't they? Negative 8, positive 3. Okay. So you remember how we do that then? And this is great practice because you'll see why here shortly. So what do we do? Uh, okay, good. 
to a B. Because we're going to split our B up into negative 8x plus 3x, right? And then we end up with four terms instead of three. And so we're able to group those like so. Okay. When we look at factoring polynomials with four terms that are bigger than square, say cubic polynomials, for example, this is the strategy we're going to try. It's the same thing, factoring by grouping. It won't always work, but it might. Yes, sir? Isn't it easier if you were to put the negative 8 with the negative 8? I mean, negative 8x. It doesn't matter. Either way, it's really not going to make any difference. Because it's, I mean, you're going to get the same, you're going to get the same factors either way. You're going to get the same, you see what I'm saying? I mean, it really well, doesn't. I just made one to be easier. Uh, maybe. I mean, depending how you look at it, it's possible. Yeah. It's, and, and, and I don't think it makes much difference because that way you'd be factoring out a 3x. This way you're factoring out what? X, yeah. So we just factor out an X, leaving us with what? 3X minus 8. 3X minus 8. And so then over here, uh, what's our One. coefficient need to be? Yeah. Either way, I mean, you guys are pretty good at this. I don't think it's going to take you much to, to, to go back to doing this stuff. So what's our answer going to be then? What is this thing in factored form? times the common leftover factor, right? So what are the solutions? Either x equals negative 1 or x equals 8 thirds, right? Good. If I set this equal to 0 and solve, add the 8, divide by 3. Good. 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 All right. Well, how could we deal with something like, for example, let's say we want to factor x squared minus 9. Remember how that factors? Now, we solved that. If we have the equation, and once again, this kind of comes down to the deal where if we wanted to solve x squared minus 9 equals 0, what would we do? Add good. We'd isolate x. Add 9 and square root plus x, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so if we were going to solve this equation, you know, we, we would isolate x. But we can factor it. We actually can factor it, can't we? What does it, so we don't do that very often, but what does that factor into? There's a pattern that we learned in Chapter 5 didn't use very much. Yeah, good. That's a difference of squares pattern, right? Like I say, we didn't use it very much because we typically just did this instead, right? And the nice thing about solving a quadratic by isolation is even if the answers are imaginary, you're still going to get them, aren't you, right? The answers here would just be if we get x squared equals 9, x equals plus or minus the square root of 9, so we get plus or minus 3, right? Now, if we solve x squared plus 9 equals 0, x squared equals negative 9. So what are my solutions going to be there? x equals plus or minus 3i. Plus or minus 3i. Good. Square root of negative 9, right? And that works great. We get the reals or the imaginaries, OK? But I, I want to show you a limitation of, of uh, well, and, and you guys, I want to, you, you told me this is a difference of squares. So if I factor this. Because it looks like x squared minus 3 squared, we get x plus 3 times x minus 3 for the factors. And of course, if I set that equal to 0, I'd get the same solutions, wouldn't I? Plus or minus 3. Okay, I want you to see, and there's a lot of subtle stuff going on here. But what if we wanted to solve the equation, let's say, x cubed minus 8 equals 0. What do you suppose I could do? What do you think, John? It would be, well, you, you have a three different 
okay, you're going to get right. And we don't know. I'm going to show you the factoring pattern in a second. But what if we were just going to try to just solve it more easily? What would you do? Um, figure out what at, like x equals x to the cube equals a, and then so negative. I mean, is that negative two? When x equals negative two. Well, okay. So if I add a to both sides, I, I can isolate x. Yeah, yeah. You do cube root. Yeah, I'm going to do the cube root. Now we haven't really learned how to do other roots of functions yet. That's something we're going to talk more about next chapter. And you know, this is one, I'll just, I'll show you how to do it just briefly right now without going into detail. And just know that we're going to be able to do this for higher level roots and fractional exponents and stuff like that as well. But there are some limitations to this. And that's why it's more important for us to be able to factor this than it was in chapter five. Watch what happens if I cube root both sides. I get back the answer x equals 2 with no plus or minus. When you take an odd root of a function, as we'll talk much more about next chapter, you don't add the plus or minus. And so we get, we get the single solution, x equals 2. But something we're going to learn about this chapter that I'll mention now, it's called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. And I've even mentioned this in the past before also. When if we have a third degree polynomial, that means that there are exactly three complex solutions, three complex number solutions. Remember that the imaginary ones, and we'll talk much more about this here shortly, have to come in complex conjugate pairs. They always did, didn't they, in chapter five? We never really probably recognized that. Maybe you did, but they always came in complex conjugate pairs. For example, right here. We get 0 plus 3i and 0 minus 3i. When you get imaginary solutions with the quadratic formula, you always get something of the form negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, right? If that gives you back an i, you're just going to get back some square root times i over some number, right? Doesn't that look like a plus or minus bi, if it's imaginary? Complex conjugates, right? A plus bi and a minus bi are complex conjugates. They always come in complex conjugate pairs, right? So what's the problem with this solution right here? Maybe not a problem, but what's, what's lacking? Say it again. Yeah, the complex conjugates. We got one real solution. We know that if you get one real, there have to be three total. But the complex ones, the imaginary ones, have to come in pairs. So there must be some hidden pair of solutions that are complex conjugates. See, the problem with this, and it's not always a problem. If you're specifically looking for real solutions, isolating x, in this case, worked great. But if you want all the solutions, it didn't do the job. It did not give us the complex solutions. And maybe we want those. Yep. Would the uh, solutions then be plus or minus 2i? No, they're not. They're harder than that, which is a little bit, they're, which is strange. It, it's not like they just pop out immediately. And the, the solution to this, or the, the strategy for this, if you need the complex solutions, you absolutely have to factor this instead of isolate x. The factoring process gives you the other complex solutions. Isolating x directly does not. Now, once again, in most cases, that's all you want. In most cases in life, you just want the real solution. And so that's good enough. Okay, But just know that there are other solutions there. So let's talk about how to get those. Okay, So uh, this is just right out of your textbook. And it's a, it's a pretty good little PowerPoint. I mean, it's not. Ideal, but it's pretty good, and it, it'll give. We're just, we're looking at some. What we're going to come up with here. Let me give you a little heads up. We're going to come up with kind of the opposite of the last stuff you did. Think about the last section we talked about. You know, it was arithmetic of polynomials. Sure, you got a little practice multiplying polynomials, adding and subtracting. Pretty straightforward stuff. Tedious, but straightforward. To me, even more important than that was the part about the the expansion rules. Right? We had some properties. We knew, for example, that the a plus b quantity squared equals what? What? What is that? So a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Right? We got a bunch of rules that showed us how we can expand polynomials from factored form 
in to expand them out into polynomial form. We're going to look at some rules that do the opposite now. We're going to look at some rules that take a, a polynomial in, in, in expanded form and factor it into factored form. Okay. So let's, I mean, we just kind of repeat this stuff. This is not something you could probably mess with. We could probably get rid of that too. We'll come back and maybe look at that later. But here are some special factoring patterns. Now we know that a sum of two cubes, if I have a cubed plus b cubed, there isn't a sum of squares, is there? Right? We only had a difference of squares. There was no sum of squares pattern. For cubes, there is. Here's how this always factors. a cubed plus b cubed always factors into two factors. A linear factor that's going to give us a solution and a quadratic factor. Now, the quadratic factor is always going to be irreducible, which means you can't factor it any further. It will never factor beyond this. And it will always yield imaginary solutions. The discriminant will always be negative, in other words. So this is where you're going to get the other two imaginary solutions. Okay? Going with that, the difference of cubes, well, here's a quick example. So if we had x cubed plus 8, we could think of the 8 as being a 2 cubed, right? So we can see this as a sum of two different squares. And so we just apply this formula. x is a, 2 is b, plug, plug and check, right? Mr. Yeah? What if that number isn't a cube? If it's not a cube, then this is not a, it, it doesn't factor conveniently. It's a great question. There is a way, of course, you could do it. Like, what would I do, for example? What do you think I would do if I had something like x cubed plus 3? and I wanted to find the imaginary solutions, how could I rewrite 3 in the form of a cube? Anybody have an idea? And this is kind of above and beyond what we're doing in this section, but it's a great question. This is a right idea. Three, if I want to write 3 as something cubed, I could just pick the cube root of 3 cubed. right? So I could write this as x cubed plus the cube root of 3 cubed and use that formula. Okay. See how that would work? Lots of trees right there. Yeah, so this would look like if I use the formula, then this would factor into x plus the cube root of 3, right? And so the real solution would just be negative cube root of 3, which is just a number your calculator gives you, right? Uh, times a squared, so that's x squared, plus, or minus, sorry, minus ab, so that's going to be cube root of 3x plus b squared. Well, what is the cube root of 3 squared? This is something we're going to talk much more about next chapter. But it ends up being, well, I mean, you can write it that way if you want to. It's the cube root of 3 squared. Another way of writing that is as 3 to the 2 thirds power. But that's for next chapter. Okay, So it's a great question. And we can do it. It's just not super convenient to do, right? Okay. For now, we would say, does this factor? No. Because when, when we say, does it factor, what we really mean is, does it factor conveniently with integer numbers, right? So we would say, no, that one is already factored. It doesn't go any further because it's not convenient to factor. Okay? Make sense? Now, when we solve equations, then maybe we do actually do this step, right? But that's kind of at the end of the next chapter. All right, so we've got these, we've got these rules. I, I want to maybe just, and, and of course, for something like this, if we have this example, if you, have, you start off with like 8x cubed minus 1, you have to be able to group that into a difference of cubes. So what quantity could we cube to get 8x cubed? Well, the quantity 2x. To the quantity 2x cubed would be the same thing as saying 2 cubed times x cubed, which gives us back our 8 times x cubed. So then we would use the quantity 2x to be our a and 1 to be our b, and we would just fill in the blanks, just plug and chuck, right? So there's another. So we have, we have these sum and difference patterns. Now let's just focus on those for a second. Because really, and I'll, give you, I'll tell you right now, up front, there are only three different kinds of factoring 
patterns that we're even going to consider. There's not very much. It's not like this is just a ton of stuff. I mean, it's really not going to be that much. Okay, let's, let's look at these. Though. Let's look at our sum and difference patterns that we know. And this probably all we'll get through today. So let's start with last chapter, right? So we know that a squared minus b squared, that's a difference of squares, factors into what again? You already told me. A squared minus No, no. You're thinking expansion pattern. What does this factor into? This is just the reciprocal of the conjugate pattern that we looked at last section, right? Remember last section we said a plus b times a minus b always gives us back a difference of squares, right? Because the cross terms cancel. So we're just reversing that process. Instead of multiplying out, we're going to go backwards and we're going to factor. So a difference of squares must factor into Product of conjugates. Okay? A plus B, A minus B, right? Make sense? Yeah. Because remember, we've reversed the arrow here. Normally we, we would multiply out and expand, but this time we're not. We're factoring. We're trying to compress things into a product of factors. Okay, what about this one? What do you say about that one? That's it. It's just, it's already, you can't factor it any further. That one, if we want to try to factor it, it doesn't go anywhere. Does not factor. Okay. All right, so now for our new stuff, let's line these up. So we've got a sum of cubes and a difference of cubes. There is a pattern here that I think helps you remember these. Okay? Here's the pattern. First of all, we know that the first factor is linear. So the, the terms have to just be to the first power. right? So we just have an a to the 1 and a b to the 1. The second factor is quadratic. So it has to be the product of linear stuff. So we're going to start off with an a squared. In the middle is going to be an a to the 1 times a b to the 1 and end up with a b squared. The powers all have to add up to 2, in there, right? Because this is the quadratic one. All we have to do is just plug in the signs. OK, here's the sign pattern. Whatever the sign is in the original expression that we're trying to factor, so if it's a sum of cubes, the first term gets the sum. Okay? The last sign is always positive, but the first two signs alternate. So if this is positive, then this one is negative. Okay? So down here, what's the first sign going to be if it's a difference of cubes? The linear factor is going to be a minus b, and the first sign in the quadratic expression would be positive. Okay? That's how you kind of remember that pattern. Okay? All right, so let's let's practice that one just a little bit here. I'm going to give you a couple. See if you can factor these. So I want you to try first of all. So if you need to get out your notebooks, if you don't have notebooks with you, and you should, but if you don't, I'll just get some scratch paper for you to use. See, just try scratching out a couple of these to get a little practice. I hate to waste graph, graph paper on this, but I think that's all I've. Nope. Never mind. Just gonna pass it around. If anybody needs a piece of scratch paper, grab one. Try this. Okay, 
let's try a cubic one. Let's try that. Yeah, I'll warn you, there's a little, this is not a hard one, but there's a trick. There's a trick here I'm throwing at you. If you just focus on that first term, it looks like maybe it's going to be a difference of cubes, doesn't it? Right? But what do we always do first when we factor? We always try to do. What's that? Reduce in what way? You're right. I mean, kind of like reducing. It's not actually reducing, but what do we always try to do? Factor something out. See if there's a greatest common factor that we can factor out, right? Okay, so by factoring something out, can we put this into a form where we get some GCF, the greatest common factor, times a difference that makes sense to us? Because this one doesn't, does it? This does not fit our difference of cubes pattern, right? Uh, 8x, what are we going to do with that? 8x is not anything cubed, is it? This one we could maybe make work, but even if we just factored out a 2, we're still stuck, aren't we? Right? If I just factored out a 2, I'd be left with x cubed minus 4x, and that doesn't work, right? I would be able to get the first part of that to look like x something cubed, x cubed. But the second part, what could I, there's nothing I could use, right? Convenient. So what should I factor out maybe instead of just a 2? 2x. 2x, sure. What if I factor out a 2x? If I take out a 2x, what am I left with? x squared. x squared, say it again. Minus 4. Okay, now how can I deal with that? Right, we got this greatest common factor out there. He's done. Once you get a greatest common factor out, it's a monomial, it's done. All we have to do now is deal with this, this other factor. What's that, though? What pattern does that fit? Okay, good. That's a difference of squares, isn't it? Right? We could think of this, at least in our mind, we could think of this as being what squared minus what squared? What's A going to be? Well, X. What's B going to be? 2, right? And so now it fits that difference of squares pattern. This thing would break apart into X plus 2, X minus 2. And now in front, I've just got my greatest common factor, 2x. So that would be my answer. We have like OK, that's a good place to stop. Okay. You get the idea? OK, we'll pick up with this Monday. short day on Monday. Well, and then I'll give you a Tuesday and Wednesday on the left. <laughs> I've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday scheduled for the lab next week, just so you know.